the book of Ruth, chapter 1, session number 2. So Ruth is a small book, it's only four chapters, um, but it reveals God's work, how God provides, not only physically, but how he provides in the prophetic, not only for one woman, but for an entire humanity. Ruth represents all of humanity. Naomi represents all of the Jews. And this is a book with a much larger plan than just the, the providence for one woman and one old lady who lost everything. So nobody really knows who wrote the book um, of Ruth. Um, they say that it was maybe written during the time of King David. Um, maybe, you know, the, how the story was told over and over again. And eventually somebody in the, in the time of King David wrote the book. Because it does say that King David um, indeed came from the, by the time that happened, only then was the book then written and it talks about this um, Moabite woman a pagan a heathen a non-Jew a non-Hebrew how she became a faithful follower of Yahuwah in weird difficult um, challenging circumstances but how she would never have learned about this God of Israel if it wasn't for Naomi and the book illustrates how simple pagan people who become obedient to God can become part of his great plan and his beautiful nation, can be grafted back into the olive tree and can indeed share in the covenant of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, him, his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Eli Melech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons was Malon and Chilion, and they were from Ephraim, but they lived in Bethlehem, Judah. They came into the country of Moab, and they continued there. So this story probably happened during the time of the judges. It doesn't tell us which judge ruled or when specifically this happened when there was a famine. Um, I, I would have liked to know which judge was actually in, um, in charge at that moment. But it might not have been a well-known judge. And also there was a famine in the land. So it immediately this whole story immediately takes me to Amos 8 verse 11 where it says, Behold, the days come, says Yahuwah, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a famine, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but a famine of the hearing the words of Yahuwah. So why would Yahuwah have sent a famine? The only time he curses Israel in the promised land is when they are disobedient to him. So in a time of, of Judah, because now um, in Bethlehem, Judah lived the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. Remember, they were later called the Jews. But they also lived Ephraimites. Elimelech and his family were from Ephraim. But they were seen as part of being Hebrew. So out of the Bethlehem Judah, which is majority from the house of Judah, it's a, it's a region where Judah comes forth. But it's for me spiritually very significant that these people were any heathen, any pagan, any stranger that becomes obedient to God and comes back into the, common, um, into the covenant with God. It's like the lost sheep that came home. The shepherd go out and he, and he looks for the lost sheep. The lost sheep are all over scripture, symbolized by the house of Israel. When um, uh, the ten tribes were scattered, um, but they were, in, they were one nation. They were seen as one nation. They were under Jeroboam and they were called the house of Israel. And Ephraim was their leader. Just like Joseph was the leader, and out of Joseph came Ephraim. And both Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh looked like Egyptians, and Judah and his other brothers didn't even recognize these lost brothers of them. So it's interesting that Elimelech, 
whose name means El is my king, God is my king, my king, my God. My king, God is my king, my king, my God. Out of Ephraim that comes forth from Judah, sent out of the region of Judah, goes into um, a pagan strange land where Yahuwah is not worshipped. And they come back, Naomi comes back with a heathen, with a pagan woman that comes back to Bethlehem, Judah. And not only is she now a lost sheep that came home, and we all say, Amen and Hallelujah, but she is taken so much further. She becomes the great-grandmother of King David. She is um, um, married into the physical tribe of Judah. So not only does she become Hebrew and Israel, but she goes further and becomes part of the royal tribe. Not only does she become part of the royal tribe just through marriage, but out of her comes both King David and Yeshua. So it's an absolutely um, amazing story of the lifelong, great, large, eternal plan that God has. Out of Judah, he sends the, the good shepherd. He is a Jew. Yeshua was born from the, from the loins of David, who was from the house of Judah, who was from the tribe of Judah. And out of Judah, he sends Yeshua. And Yeshua brings back the lost sheep. This is the much bigger picture. And then when the lost sheep does come back, and they start to learn about the Torah, then things just amazingly change. In the condition where there was famine, and there was um, huge problems. How can a pagan now become part of Israel? This is a big thing. And now suddenly the New Testament makes sense. Where it says God loved the world, the whole world, so much that he gave his only son. And that includes all the heathen and the pagans from the area. It specifically includes Ruth. And in the Old Testament we see so much evidence of how Yeshua can reunite both the pagan world with God's own people. As we learned so much in the book of Judges about how God's own wife became a whore, but then when we come out of Babylon, out of the whore of Babylon, we become the wife again. So this is the story, this is the summary of Ruth, how a whoring Moabite, she wasn't a whore, nobody, nobody does it say she was a whore, but she was in a whoring system, she was in a whoring religion. So how the whore became not only saved and blessed, but she became wife and she became um, absorbed into the messianic bloodline. It is beautiful. So Elimelech, let's look at the names. Al is my Melech, God is my king. His wife is Naomi. It's from the Hebrew word Noam, Noam, meaning my delight. My delight, Naomi, my delight. Remember that is so important. Then we have a two sons, Malon and Chilion. So um, these names, when we see who gets married to who, it's quite amazing. Orpa gets married to Chilion. Chilion means pining, destruction or annihilation. Ruth gets married to Malon, and Malon means sick or weakened. So probably Elimelech, God is my king, Naomi, my delight. Unfortunately, during the time of um, this book with a famine in the land, and I'm, I'm um, thinking there's probably a lot of um, uh, rebellion against God and disobedience. Uh, a rebellion against God and disobedience and idolatry because God would never have allowed a famine if they were in covenant with him. So during this bad period of time, these two God-fearing people made the decision to call their sons pining, destruction, annihilation. Um, um, Chilion. Pining, destruction, annihilation, because we are pining, God, because you are destroying us, because we have become annihilated from you. And it's funny how Orpa, the, the whore from Babylon, who chooses to stay in Babylon and chooses not to come out of Babylon and, and go back to Israel and become part of the people of Yahuwah, 
how she is the one that marries that that gets married to him who is called pining destruction annihilation she she is going to continue she she is going to continue pining away she's going to be destroyed and she's going to be annihilated from yahua and that's the choice she made and the other son is called sick and weakened malon and ruth gets married to malon and then as ruth through her marriage with malon being sick and weakened chooses the healing of yahua rafa chooses to to come into covenant with yahua chooses the god of naomi and the people and the land of naomi how um yahua said that isaiah prophesied of him he will come to heal the sick and bring those in, out of prison and bring sight to the blind how ruth is the one that that gets married to sick and weakened but she gets healed by this god and she's the one that comes back into the promised land so the one the one, then that came out of bethlehem judah bait lehem the house of bread and judah praise yahua bethlehem judah the house of bread praise yahua this is where they come out from because currently in the house of bread in bethlehem bait lehem there's a famine and i believe it's it's showing us the much bigger picture not a famine of bread like amos said but a famine of the bread from heaven the words of god and they came to moab and moab means of my abba mo ab of my father so out of bethlehem judah they went al is my king my delight with sick and destruction here they go to of the father this is a, a lot like the people of god you know currently the house of judah they they are living in in bethlehem they are living in in bethlehem judah they carry the names of my delight my god is my king but yet they are sick and weakened and and pining and they are currently experiencing famine and destruction and annihilation yes they they have clung to the covenant they keep the sabbath but with the whole kabbalah and talmud interference they have totally forgotten about the torah and and their whole life um circles around what the rabbis teaches them out of the talmud they are pining they are sick they are weakened and here they they also go to of the father but of the father is not inside the land of the father um it's like they are leaving this um spiritual land and they and they are going to look for bread somewhere else because there is actually a famine of the torah inside their own land and who do who does elimelech naomi and her two sons who do they meet verse 3 and elimelech naomi naomi's husband died and she was left she and her two sons and they took them wives of the women of moab in the first place they weren't really supposed to marry outside the tribes of israel we've learned about this now since the book of genesis but they are here in exile in babylon in moab in a, a canaanite city a land and now they get married to the canaanite women so the one's name was orpa and the other one's name was ruth and they dwelt there almost 10 years funny 10 years for the 10 lost tribes how somebody from judah is sent out lives in a pagan land lives in egypt in babylon for 10 years presenting the 10 lost tribes and then she comes back with the bride that it, that has come out of the 10 lost tribes back to um israel absolutely beautiful and they are also ephraim naomi is from ephraim and um ephraim is the leader of the 10 lost tribes so for 10 years they lived outside israel so the name of ruth is in hebrew reut reut and that means to be a mate to be a companion um to have friendship with neighboring women um reut and orpa orpa means gazelle 
Orpa means gazelle. Gazelle, you know, like a beautiful um, um, what is a gazelle? It's like a it's like a buck, a, a book, ne? One of those beautiful um, gazelles that run through the um, through the fields, and they've got and they've got a long, strong neck. So um, the root word of orpa in the Hebrew is oref. Um, Orpa means gazelle. Oref means long, stiff neck. Because those bucks, you know, those, um, what is a buck? You know, antelope. Um, it, it, bucks sound so strange. But you know what I mean? Those four legged, beautiful animals, a kudu and an elant, you know, those are bucks. Those are gazelles. So, so oref means back of neck, long, stiff neck. And stiff neckedness. You know, how many times does the Bible say, God says to his people, you've become a stiff-necked people. What is a stiff neck? You are standing straight and proud, upright. You are not bowing your neck. You are uncircumcised. The Bible compares stiff-neckedness with rebellion, disobedience, and uncircumcision. So, coincidentally, gets married to um, Gileon, whose name means destruction. The stiff-necked people of this world are married to the people that are annihilated from God. Orpa marries, marries Gileon. Stiff-necked, uncircumcision, whore of Babylon, doesn't want to leave her father and mother, doesn't want to become one with Naomi doesn't want to go back to the covenant with the creator of heaven and earth. She gets married to the one who then prophesies pining, destruction and annihilation. But Reut, Ruth, who is um, a chaver, a friend, a mate, you want to become friends with the neighboring woman. Um, she's a neighboring woman from a pagan um, nation, but she, in her there is um, this longing to go back with Naomi. She learned a longing to go back with Naomi. She learned about Yahuwah from Naomi and she chooses to then leave everything she knows behind, not like Lot's wife looking back. No, she looks forward to go to the promised land. Although she knows, she knows there's nothing you know, this this famine, both her and her um, mother-in-law are widows. They're going to become beggars. But it's still better for her to follow Naomi, whose heart is pining um, for Jerusalem, who wants to go back to Bethlehem, Judah. She's annihilated from Bethlehem, Judah, from her God and from her people. And she wants to go back. She's sick. She's weakened. But through Reut, that becomes her friend, her mate, that takes her um, around the shoulders and help her all the way back. How this pagan woman and this um, uh, house of Judah woman who comes from Bethlehem, Judah, how they together, hand in woman who comes from Bethlehem, Judah, how they together, hand in hand, reunited, restored kingdom of God, goes back to the covenant land, to the promised land. But Orpa, you know, she stays behind. And when God's judgment come upon this world, the whore of Babylon, with all their sick, annihilated, destroyed, pining, um, what is the right word? Sad people will be destroyed. Orba thought she, she would be more happy to stay behind and find another husband. Ruth said, although I cannot find another husband, Naomi doesn't have more children, it's fine. I'm going to stick with Naomi. And I'm going to stick with Naomi's people, and I want, I want to stick with Naomi's God. So through the famine that happened in the land, Yahuwah sends out his delight. Yahuwah, our king, Elimelech, and Naomi, light, Naomi, is sent out into Moab of the Father. Although they are sick and weakened, pining and destroyed and annihilated, they, they are sent out, and yes, all the men, they, they die. All the men pine away because of sickness or illness or whatever made Elimelech and the two boys die. But the, the man dies. The God, El is my Melech, my God, my King dies. Yeshua died so that Naomi can bring Ruth back into the covenant um, and she can be reconciled with the people of God. So because my God is my King, and it is his delight 
to bring sick Gentiles back to become Echad, to become restored, to become one nation again in the hand of the Messiah. So he wants to bring the, the sick Gentiles back with the annihilated Jew, the hand of the Messiah. So he wants to bring the, the sick Gentiles back with the annihilated Jews, with the annihilated people from Bethlehem, Judah, who was annihilated for 10 years, the 10 camels, the 10 virgins, the 10 tribes, annihilated only for a period, so that they are no longer alien, that the sick Gentiles, together with the annihilated Jews, will no longer be alien to each other. They will no, no longer not know each other, like Joseph wasn't known by his brothers. He was Egyptian. Ephraim and Manasseh looked pagan. They looked sun god. They, they weren't recognized. So this is Yahuwah's bigger plan, to bring the sick Gentiles back to become Echad, to become one with the annihilated Jews, with the Jews back in Bethlehem, Judah, that were suffering famine for these 10 years. For the 10 years they were suffering the word of God. They are no longer strangers to each other, but through their union, through the union of Ruth, who was, who was sick, but she became healed. And then eventually she got married to um, a man that was from the tribe of Judah. Not an Ephraimite, not a Benjamite. He was from Judah. And, and the union to, to become a heart with him, to know him, to yada, to be intimate with him. She became pregnant and out of her came forth the king of kings, Yeshua himself. And the throne of David came forth out of him. This is God's beautiful big plan. Jew and Gentile will not be regathered. If the prodigal son does not come home. So if Ruth didn't come back to Israel, if the prodigal son didn't come back home, there would have been no reuniting and his older brother. There would, would have been no reuniting for, for Gentiles to be grafted back into the olive tree. And like Paul says in um, Ephesians 2 uh, or Philippians 2, how we were once strangers we were once gentiles we were once pagans we all um, were disobedient to god but now through messiah we are back um, into the covenant with god and we become part of the commonwealth and of the promises of the god of abram isaac and jacob and this chapter number one gives us the lesson that god's providence is certain he doesn't make mistakes the famine and the death of these three men, it wasn't a mistake. It was part of a much bigger plan. He unfolds all the mysteries of his divine purposes for our lives as scattered in the Gentile nations, but also the people of he's got a purpose for his house. And sometimes it looks strange and mysterious for us, but he doesn't make mistakes. He will never go back on his covenant so even through death and famine and sick and weakened and destruction and annihilation his big plan is still working we can never lose hope he unfolds the mysteries of his divine purpose in our lives he has a goal after or behind all these happenings we also see that the saving goal the purposes of god often begins when they are dark and difficult, hungry and sad periods in our lives, like we are now in the end days. It's going to be a dark and sad and difficult period in our lives. But through this, through the famine in Judah and through the annihilation of the lost sheep in the pagan countries, annihilation of the lost sheep in the pagan countries, God's big plan is busy working. We see how Joseph is eventually with Ephraim and Manasseh um, reunited with Jacob and how Jacob transfers the covenant onto Ephraim and Manasseh and how in Ezekiel 36, the two sticks become one, how the prodigal son comes home and is back into the family with God and then life can come forth and the eternal life that is promised by God can, can only um, become established his kingdom on this earth can only become established once Ruth and, and Naomi turns back home 
and gets looked after um, the, the man from Judah and gets married to again. And this, the marriage supper of the lamb happens again. And out of that union, we have the son of David. And he comes forth and he rules and comes forth and he rules and reigns. And we look back upon our lives and we think, what did we go through? For 10 years, we were lost in a pagan country. Our own people died of hunger. My own husband and, and my sons died. And then at the end, it says that Ruth was better than seven husbands. Seven is the perfect number of God. So even though we, we lost what was precious, but what, what it was that was precious was anyway sick and weakened and pining. It was something that would have led to destruction. So although we lost that, we have returned back home with something that was seven times better than what we lost originally. Doesn't the Bible say what the grasshopper has eaten, Yahuwah will um, um, repay and, and restore seven times? Isn't it amazing? She was, Ruth is seven times better than your two boys, the women of Judah, told Naomi at the end. So to one. Elimelech's, um, Elimelech died, Naomi's husband, and she was left with her two sons. So look at the Hebrew. When my God is king dies, I am left with sick and destruction. <laughs> when Elimelech died, Naomi was left with Malon and Chilion. So they took them two wives, Orpa and um, Ruth, and then Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So her husband died, the two boys died, and now she's left with a stiff-necked gazelle and a mate, a neighboring friendship woman. What will happen next? What happens next is that God's providence and God's promises and God's covenant is slowly but surely coming to pass. And after 10 years in this strange country, losing everything that was precious to her, she heard in verse 6, um, she heard that the Yahuwah have visited his people and gave them bread again. So the famine was over. There'll be a time when the famine of the word of God is over. And I believe that is the time now. Absolutely. For 2000 years, we did not understand the bread of life, the word of God. We only read Psalm 91, Psalm 23, and then of course the New Testament. And even then we didn't understand. We were taught from the pulpit about how Jesus died for us and we all have a ticket to heaven. And that was about it. You know, as long as you believe in Jesus, you don't have to believe God. As long as you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, you've got a ticket to heaven. And, uh, you know, don't have anything to do with the Jews or, the, or Israel. None of that matters. All that matters is you believe in Jesus. You've got a date written in the front of your Bible. And you've got a ticket to heaven. So we had a famine. We had a scarcity of the prophetic covenant word of God for 10 years. But there is a time that God will now open the prophecies again. He said to Daniel, seal it. It's not for you to understand and it's not for anybody in the next two and a half thousand years to understand. It is only for the end time generation. So Naomi, my delight, has heard that God has ended the famine. She heard she shema. When, when we shema in the pagan countries where we have been scattered and we return to the bread, the Beth Lechem, Beit Lechem, the house of bread. Lechem is bread, Beit is house. And we return to the house of bread, which is the scriptures, the word of God, Yeshua, the living word. And we understand everything from beginning all the way to end. Then we sows with her daughters-in-law, so that she can return back to the, to the God of Israel and to the country of Israel. And she left the country of Moab. Just like we left Egypt, just like we must come out of Babylon, just like Lot had to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, you come out of all those countries and you come back to where the Lord have chosen to put his name, Jerusalem. The covenant with Abraham, the promised land, not the physical land now. The physical land is still in the famine at the moment. But under the Gentiles, 
under us as Joseph, the fire of the word of God has begun to burn. And it, the, the fire was ignited. Yahuwah himself ignited the fire under certain people from the house of Judah. And these Jewish people, st- these Jewish people started reading the New Testament and they recognized that Yeshua is not Jesus. They recognized that Ephraim is lost and scattered. And they started teaching these principles from scripture. And then Gentile pastors started listening, Shema, hearing these words. And the famine was ended. And more and more Jewish rabbis and Christian pastors started teaching the truth. And that is how we got to know of it. That is how we got to learn of it. And that is why as we're sitting in every tribe, nation, tongue and country where we have been scattered, where we are sick and weakened, we were annihilated from the commonwealth of Israel, we learned about the truth. And now we want to grab, like Ruth grabbed Naomi. Or only kissed her, like Judas, or like Esau. And then she went back to her pagan world. Oh, like Esau. And then she went back to her pagan world. But Ruth clave. She clung. We want to cling. Like the Bible says, ten men will cling to the robes of the Jew. And say, please, Jew, take us with you. For we know God um, is with you. We know that you know God. And that is why I love Deuteronomy 4, verse 26 to 32 so much where it says, you will disobey me, and then I will scatter you amongst all the whoring nations, and you will forget that you were ever part of me. You'll become um, absorbed in these whoring nations. But in the end days, when you are in tribulation, you will remember my words, and you will come out from the whoring nations, and you will be reunited in the covenant land. This is God's original plan and these are the times is over the time of the sealing of the prophecies are over we are reading the prophets and we are understanding what we are reading because the famine is over and God is visiting his people with bread again and we recognize not like our forefathers we recognize the bread that falls from heaven that is Yeshua that if we eat him then we will live forever. Not eat him like a cannibal. That's what the Pharisees were thinking because they were still under the sick and weakened, pining and annihilated famine. They read the Torah, but they didn't eat it. It didn't become part of their, um, it wasn't digested inside their spirit. They didn't love it. They didn't learn it. They didn't understand it. They just read it on the surface and they said, Oh, you are healing somebody on the Sabbath day. So you are going to go to hell. You know, you are breaking the Sabbath. All dust. If you were reading and hearing and understanding and loving the word, you would not, um, um, uh, what is the word? Redenier. You would not think like a stupid um, childish person regarding the laws. Um, they were still pining away because they, they were in a famine of the words. And the times have come. Now is the time that the Lord is visiting his people with a bread. And, and because the famine is over and we can shema, we can hear, we can now also rise up, stand up. Let us go back to Bethlehem, Judah. The Levite, remember in the book of Judges, said to his wife, Rise up, let us go back home. But she was dead. Orpah is dead. She is married to destruction. And then destruction died. And she chose not to go with my delight, Ut, my friend, my mate, to become part of, of um, Israel again. She, she decided to, to stay dead. She was too dead, like the concubine, to rise up and return home. Hey, Ruth, this book of Ruth is really amazing. And um, I hope you will read it. Read the whole book of Ruth. And then we still go through every verse by verse. And we see all these amazing things just jumping out of the page to us. And now she rises up, Naomi, with her two daughters-in-law. We are also the daughters in law 
We are the daughters in the Torah. The Torah is the law. The Torah is the covenant. The Torah is the words of God. The Torah is the words of God that became flesh, Yeshua himself. We are the daughters of God. We are the daughters in law. We are the daughters in law. Let us use the law. Let us come into the law. Let us see how the law will look after us. Like Ruth came back to the land. And then according to the law, she was allowed to glean um, the fields of the Jewish people. Um, the specific man, Boaz, who was from the house of Judah, who was from the tribe of Judah, she was allowed under the Torah to go and glean um, food from his fields. And she was allowed as per Torah to get married to this um, noble man from Judah. She, a Gentile pagan, was allowed to marry inside the tribe of Judah according to the law. We are learning the law. We are the daughters and the sons of the law. We are no longer strangers to the law. We learn the law and we are given up to the law. We learn the law and we are given a place in the house of God. Ruth was given the place of a queen. Her great-grandson was the king. She was Queen Ruth. And so the Bible says that you will no longer, you strangers to the commonwealth of Israel, who chooses to keep my Sabbath days holy, uh, holy, and who choose to do what is my delight, God says, Naomi, you will no longer be strangers, but you will become pillars in the temple of God, and you will receive names even better than those of sons and daughters. And this is what, what the, the book of Ruth is teaching us. And, and this is after we have returned with Naomi, we are in the covenant now. We are no longer in, in Moab. We are no longer Orpa with stiff necks. But we still know a lot of Orpas. We still know a lot of Naomi's and Elimelech's. And we need to um, show them how God is um, teaching his covenant plan, his big goal, his huge agenda, his eternal plan since Jacob went over the Yabuk River. And he split up his family, his 12 tribes. How God's plan is eternal to restore those 12 tribes. So that the new Jerusalem with its 12 foundations can come back to this earth. And God's kingdom, his family, his house can be restored. That is what Bereshit, Genesis, the beginning is all about. Bereshit, the house the, the head of the house who is showing us the sign of the covenant. Because what is it all about? God had to chase us out of the Garden of Eden. Out of the Garden of Eden. But he wants us to come back to the Garden of Eden. He wants to restore us to his house. He is our father. He wants to restore us to marriage covenant. He is our kinsman, redeemer and our husband. And this